Okay. So if you don't mind me saying lots of stupid things and yeah, I mean I can say some stupid things as well if that's okay, then that's fine, yeah. yeah. No, like, uh, I'm not one tenth as smart as you are, so I don't know. Um so yeah, so I I mean you want to know a bit more about all these subjects. Uh, but I thought maybe the best thing is, as I say, to ask, to start with a very concrete uh, question. And Look, I, I, I suggest the question, question I would like, sorry? No, no, you, you go ahead. The question I would to, like to suggest is very simple, is what's equality? What is equality? Yeah. What is equality? Uh, equality in type theory or equality in yeah, so equality, I would say equality in mathematics, uh, uh, but I come to type theory, okay. So uh, the question is, when are two things equal? And uh, what are the laws of equality, basically? And um, yeah, I think it makes a difference whether you think about type theory or set theory. Um, because, okay, in set theory, the answer seems to be so very simple because set theory, everything is a set. So, and the set is basically a tree. Yeah? I mean, it's a tree where you can uh, uh, commute and identify subtrees. I mean, if they're the same, yeah, but it's basically a tree, yeah. And everything in set theory can be represented as a tree. Uh, it's a bit like Lisp, I don't know, in Lisp, everything is an uh, uh, expression. What do you mean by representing sets as trees? I mean, a set is a tree. I mean, I would say that's what it is, right? So, I mean, hang on, I can, I can, uh, maybe I share my screen. Uh, okay, okay, maybe I can, uh, let me see. And I go to my whiteboard. Well, what I mean is a set, oh, uh, that's not right. That's not right, oh, oh, I have a problem. Oh, I have a problem with my pen. I should have checked this before. Yeah, that's not good. Um, no. Oh, yeah, no. Pen should be fine. Okay, I don't know. Uh -huh. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, that works. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Are you still there? Yes. Oh, no. Okay, can you see my, oh yeah, you can see my, oh no. Yes, I can see your eyes now. Mm -hmm. So like a set, yeah, like something like this, okay. Yeah, that's Not a tree, good. right? There's a tree, there's uh, one subtree, which has no further subtree, and another one, which has one subtree. Okay, okay. Yeah. So sets are trees. Um, I mean, the trees where you, where the order of the subtrees doesn't matter, and where you can, I mean, you don't repeat the same subtree, right? But otherwise, mm -hmm. they're trees. Mm -hmm. And because you represent everything as a tree, it is clear when two trees are equal, right? Two trees are equal if they have. If they have the same subtrees, so it's like a recursive definition, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so for example, this tree and this tree, they're equal because they have no subtrees, right? So they both mm -hmm. represent, I mean, here in this notation, they both represent the empty set. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's called, uh, how's your set theory? The, the axiom of extensionality, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for all uh, x, y, if for all z, z is element x, if and only if z is element y, then x equals y, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so that's quite, uh, in a way, maybe, I mean, when you first learn set theory, I think you're quite impressed by this beauty of this very simple theory. I don't know how it's for you, I mean, uh, it, it, it took me a while 
to realize that it's maybe not so good, but uh, it's, um, but I will tell you why. Okay. So everything is represented as a set, whether it's a number or a algebraic object, a structure, a function, everything is a set in set theory, right? Yeah. And, uh, and there lies the problem a bit um, because sometimes you may mean something different. Um, so it's like, like in computer science, okay, in, in programming, it, it, there's often the question that a quality function, which compares two objects and decides whether they're equal. Right? And now the question is, what's equality? And here, there's an easy answer, right? Because in, in computer science and uh, in, in a computer, everything is represented as a sequence of bits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and two uh, objects should be, maybe you could say are the same if they're the same sequence of bits, right? That, that seemed to be a reasonable definition of equality, but it isn't really because often uh, you have pointers, right? And, and, and hence the, the, uh, uh, the equality then depends on and which address the object is. And that should really matter, right? That should so matter. It should not matter. I mean, because, I mean, you have the same structure, uh, uh, which is represented just in a different place in memory, then the two should be equal, right? I mean, that's just, it's, it's just the detail of the representation, uh, mm -hmm. what, what the address is, yeah? I mean, it may, on a, on a different computer, maybe in a different address. So, so why should this matter? Right? That, that's really mm -hmm. a bad idea. Um, so and similar in, in, in mathematics, uh, um, so we may have two, two, two mathematical objects, um, which are not really, okay, which are not really different in a fundamental way, uh, but they have different representations. Yeah. I mean, Thank example, would, yeah, example would be, the natural numbers, you can represent them, uh, okay, like natural numbers, so that they're like, actually in, in, in set theory already, uh, there, there's uh, the von Neumann natural numbers, right? Uh, so zero, that's like, you know, they, how they work. So zero is the empty set, and one is the set containing the empty set, and two is the set containing, okay, I just write it, I don't want to write all these brackets, right? And three is, Zero, one, two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, von Neumann. But now there is a, another by one by um, uh, Zermelo. So it starts the same way. Okay, this is the same. Uh, uh, just contains the empty. But then two just contains one, and three just contains two, right? I mean, always the okay, same. Okay, here's zero. So I should really give them different names, right? So this is zero for Neumann. Uh, right. And this is uh, zero Frege, right? So the same zero Frege and one Frege are the same, but two Frege is already different, right? So this is a bit like using different addresses. I mean, as far as everything, what you do with natural numbers, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, all what you can say about natural numbers, these two representations behave exactly the same. But you can, in, in set theory, you can express uh, this property. You can say, uh, yeah, you can say, is two a subset of, uh, or it's no, like it's one, yeah, no, that's two. No, it's two, is two a subset of three, yeah? So two a subset of three is true here, and it's false here, right? Mm -hmm. And why is this bad? Because when I talk about the natural numbers, I want to talk about structural operation, right? Um, but here, I'm talking about the representation. And like in computer science, representation shouldn't matter. Yeah. So what I'm saying, these two representations should be really indistinguishable. Because as far as what 
as far as natural numbers are concerned, there's no difference. It's only the actual implementation which is different. And that I would like to hide. So I would say, I would like to say two numbers are equal. Uh, yeah, so if they are the same numeral, yeah, if they represent the same number. And I, I'd like not to be able to talk about the representation. Representations of something should be should be hidden. Yeah. And that's what type theory is about. Or I mean, that's, that, that's not the only thing, but I think it's a very important aspect. So in type theory, you, you have a sort of a, a fixed interface to a type. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what are the differences between types and sets? In, in, in set theory, everything is a set. Um, but in type theory, there's no universal type of all mathematical objects, yeah? Um, which makes sense, right? Uh, I find, uh, because if I think of mathematical objects, I always think they, they come with a type, right? And I don't have to think about the idea of a mathematical object as such, but I can think of different, like I can think of numbers or uh, structures, groups, and rings, and whatever, yeah, or trees, but but I don't have to have one one general thing which covers all of them. That seems to be a rather strange idea. Right? So in type theory, every object always can be only thought of an element of a type, a particular type. So for example, if I have the object, if I the number two, what's going with my pen here. I don't know, something wrong with my pen. Oh. Um, oh, I have to delete this again. Oh, no, I can just go back. Okay. So, so for example, the number, that's not, I'm the, okay. The number two doesn't really make sense. If I say, I mean the two as an element of the natural numbers, that makes sense. Right? So in type theory, I don't have objects on their own. They, they only are elements of a type. I can only understand them as elements of a type. So in particular, I cannot talk about elements without knowing their type. And every element should have exactly one type. Um, so yes, you could say, yeah, but what about the integers? Isn't there a number two in the integers? Why, well, that's true. Uh, and indeed, there is an embedding from the natural numbers into the integers. And we have a notation that we use the same symbol, but actually we mean different things, right? So even in set theory, the representation of the natural numbers and the representation of the integers are quite different, right? So it's, it's actually not in this, it's, it's not, it's actually even in set theory, it's not usually true that this holds. This is simply a lie, right? Um, so really what we have is, a, is, a, is an embedding and, and, and we can then agree that we don't uh, make it explicit, that, that, we, that we hide it. So if you expect an integer and I give you natural numbers, then you know, oh yeah, I have to apply this embedding, right? This, mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and in, okay, but let's go further. In type theory, um, so what are the natural numbers in type theory? Uh, natural numbers, uh, so they're, several definitions, but here's one. You say, so zero is a natural number, and then there is an operation suck, which is a function which given natural numbers, number uh, returns natural numbers. And these are called the constructors. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, now the idea is that every natural number is made out of these constructors. But how do I express this? I can express this in type theory by, by talking about what are functions out of the natural numbers. And so to define a function uh, from n to a, where a is any type, yeah, I just have to define uh, f0. So this is, I have to give a z in a, right? And I have to define f of suck of n in terms of uh, of yeah 
have a Cn and f of n. Okay. So sorry, I'm using here functional programming notation. So a function applied to an argument is just written next to it, right? So, so did we talk about this? So f of a, which in mm -hmm. mathematics you write like this, in, in mm -hmm. functional programming write like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you have a function g, which is a function from natural numbers to a to a, right? So, so what I have said to define a function f from the natural numbers to a, you need to give me a z and a g, and then that's the scheme. Yeah. So that's the scheme you have seen, right? Primitive recursion. Now there is a little. But then, you, but then you assume from the very beginning that all the functions are recursive functions. Uh, yeah. I. I mean. Um, First of all, I don't actually, but um, because this is a, a valid scheme, even if you don't assume this, right? Uh, 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 but uh, I, I personally, I, I do assume because a function, uh, for me, a function is something where I can put something in and I get something out. Right? So yeah, okay. So the reason I'm asking maybe, maybe because in step theory, there is no assumption a priori that functions have to be computable ways. Right? I don't have any fun, uh, assumption either. It, it's not what I mean by a function. I mean, I, I, I have no assumptions, but a function to me is something you put something in, you get something out. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's what I understand under a function. I say a function which is not computable is not a function because it doesn't function, right? Uh, it's the wrong word. Yeah? Uh, so yeah, so maybe I should have said at the beginning and another important point about uh, type theory uh, is the central role of functions. Yeah? So, uh, okay, little, little, uh, 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 I should come back to here. I don't know, maybe I do a new, uh, um, okay. Uh, so functions, yeah. Functions, so in set theory, a function is a is a relation basically right? So a, a function from A to B, and set theory is a is a relation a subset of A times B, uh, such that for all A in A, there exists exactly one B in B, and B, such that A comma B is an element in R. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a function. Now. Um, the function is really uh, uh, in, in, uh, in set theory quite a derived object. Actually, first of all, we have to derive we have to derive what are products. Products are not primitive in set theory, right? So we have to explain what are products, and then we define what's a function. Um, but for me, okay, so that's that's the set theoretic view of a function. Uh, for me, uh, a function is like a function from A to B. Is a box. Right, code F, where I input A's and the out get B's. Okay, and it's a it's a black box actually. So the all I can do if you give me a function, all I can do is I put something in and get something out. Yeah. Now, we can argue whether it has to be computable or whether you're allowed to use magic. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to magic. If you believe in magic, that's fine with me. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe in magic, but uh, I mean, it's a question of religion, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, uh, Everett uh, Bishop once said, classical mathematics is, is in intuitionistic mathematics plus the belief in God. Yeah? So if you say a function could be made by God and God knows if I feed it, the, the, the a Turing machine and knows whether it, it stops or not, it can output a boolean. So that's fine. Okay. It has, it has, it is not so much the, the, the notion of a function as a question of a religion, which we want to leave out of mathematics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we leave religion out. So function could be computable, could be not computable. I have not a particular fixed view on this. I mean, I do have a fixed view on this, but uh, it, it doesn't matter for, for, for the theory, right? Mm -hmm. So in type theory, the functions are really fundamental. They're the thing you start with. So for example, what is a relation? Here, a relation is something fundamental, but a relation, oops. Relation in type theory 
is a function. It's a function from A to B to prop. Yeah, it's a function. So you see, it's the other way around. In, in set theory, you reduce functions to relations. And here, functions are the starting point. And then I say, okay, what is what is the relation? A relation uh, between A and B is something you feed it. It's, it's, it's a machine, yeah? R, you feed it an A, you feed it a B, and out comes the proposition. Mm -hmm. That's the view here. Okay, let's go. Have you got a question about this? I mean, not, uh... So I'm just wondering. So it's more fundamental and less concrete, probably. But um, so my no, it's very concrete. What... Actually, it's more concrete. A, a function mm -hmm. in in type theory is actually something, as you say, uh, functions are usually defined by uh, by by a rule, right? Like, can we find f? A function from n to n, and now for every natural number, I have to give a result. So like this, that's mm -hmm. very concrete. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, how do I get? Back Can I just ask a book? question that I kind of I'm thinking about? Type theory, yeah. what, what kind of thing is it? Is it an axiomatic theory or how do you think about it? Okay, let me first find my other, I'm now a bit upset because I can't find my other R ah, here. Okay, no, that was not good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, yeah, so, so uh, type theory is a, is a possible way, possible foundation of mathematics, yeah? like uh, ZFC set theory. Um, it is, um, it, it, it was designed as the foundation of constructive mathematics. So in this way you're right, but I think it, 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 it's, uh, actually, uh, independent of this. Uh, you can actually do, you can do type theory without having to do, to be constructive, even though it's very natural to be constructive. Um, so yeah, uh, it is, uh, it is certainly, I mean, set theory, there's more than one set theory and type theory is also evolving an evolving system. So it's not like exactly this type theory. Uh, there's uh, certainly more than one possible formulation of type theory, yeah. But obviously there's an idea, like there's an idea behind set theory, there's an idea behind type theory. And I just tried to describe this uh, in, in like giving you these ideas. I think the ideas was like, so Types are fundamental. Uh, you can, and I'm not, I, I can't really give a definition of a type. Like it's like, give a definition of a word without using words. I mean, it's a bit, yeah. So a type is, is like, when you talk about a mathematical object, you always should think about what type they belong to. But I think that's quite natural. That's what people do. Usually, if you do mathematics, you always should see, you know, say, I have here a something, I don't know what it is. You say, okay, here's a natural number, give me a natural number, give me a ring, give me, give me a tree. Yeah? I mean, you always refer to a type. So I, I think it is actually quite quite natural, yeah. In set theory, that's actually less natural, I find, because in a set theory, if you want to say for all natural numbers, you say, you hold something, you say, for all X, so you write for all X element N, something holds. What this really means in set theory, for all x, for all sets, if x is an element of n, then something holds. So this is, for, for me, it's a bit of a, a unnatural because if you think about, you want to say something for all natural numbers, but actually you express something for all sets. You say, for all sets, which turn out to be natural numbers, something holds, yeah? That seems to be really a bit, uh, it's 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 unnatural, right? If I want to talk about all natural numbers, I don't want to have to refer to all sets. Yeah, so it's a bit of a hack. But okay, people get used to these hacks. I I, I don't like it uh, for the reasons I I, have, I try to give, right? Uh, because you think about elements all the time, uh, you get this uh, representation dependence. Yeah, uh, so. So I, I, so I do think that, that type theory 
is actually quite close to intuitive mathematics. Yeah. So we talk about elements of types. We don't encode everything as a set, which seems to be quite a absurd idea. Uh, uh, and when we quantify, then we talk about element of a type and only about those and not about everything. So, um, okay, so I, I want to just uh, to give you the definition of the natural numbers in, in, in uh, type three. I haven't given, I actually, I haven't written down, uh, okay, in, in, in set theory, uh, you, 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 you basically encode the one of these choices uh, as the natural numbers. And then you have the axiom of infinity, which basically says uh, there is a set which contains exactly all the von Neumann natural numbers. And then this comprehension, you can get it down to exactly the natural numbers, right? But you could also use the Zermelo natural numbers. And by the way, I don't know, do you know, uh, the axiom of replacement, the, the axiom scheme of replacement, yeah? Uh, uh, it wouldn't hurt if you remind it. Okay, I, I, I'm, I mean, I don't want to give you the definition because it's a bit of a mouthful and I couldn't remember it, Psst. but uh, mm -hmm. exactly. But I can give you the, the gist of it, yeah? Yeah. Um, okay, the problem is if you have, uh, so this is actually the difference between Zermelo and Zermelo Frankel, right? Uh, so Zermelo uh, uh, is, Started the type theory and Frankel, or was the other way around? Uh, one of them. I mean, Samuel started it, I think, and Frankel added the axiom scheme of replacement. So there was this problem with Samuel that if you used the von Neumann numbers, maybe you were not able to prove that the Samuel numbers are set. Uh, something like, I mean, in some cases, you had one set, but something isomorphic to it, you couldn't prove to be a set. And the axiom scheme of replacement basically says, if you have two sets uh, and you have like a, a function, I mean, um, uh, 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 I guess surjective relation, uh, yeah, then if one of them is a set, the other one is a set as well. Yeah. That's the mm -hmm. axiom scheme of replacement, yeah. So they had to build this in because otherwise I couldn't even show if, I, if, I, if, if you have the wrong definition of, of, of natural numbers that they're actually a set. Anyway, uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 let's go back to type theory. In type theory, so how do I define natural numbers? Yes, also there's more than one way to define the natural numbers. Here is one. Uh, so natural numbers are an example of an inductive definition. Inductive definition, okay. So I define what are the constructors, and then in a way I turn a handle and I get this elimination scheme, which is basically primitive recursion. Now. Uh, I'm actually cheating because this is not, this is a special case. The, the general scheme, I, I can write you down as well, is, is this is called recursion. And then we have, a, okay, this is called recursion or primitive recursion. But uh, the general scheme is called elimination. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very slight uh, generalization of, of primitive recursion. So what you say, you need, okay, then need dependent types. You like, like say, let, let's say you have a type, um, let's call it B, not to get confused, which is a dependent type. It, it's a family of type. So that's a function from natural numbers to the universe, which you call set. I mean, call it type, but I'm just used to call it set. It's not set from set theory. It's a set is, is I mean, maybe I shouldn't use set. Okay, maybe it just gets confusing. Uh, uh, okay, let's write it as, as, as u, u for the universe of types. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So b is a function for every natural number, it gives you a type. And now I want to define a function, I call it f again, I mean, that's not a good idea, which for every natural number n gives me an element of b of n. Right? So it's a dependent function. Uh, so if I feed it an element, uh, it gives me B of of this element. Yeah, so, so there could be different types depending for, of the number. And now I'm just uh, say the same scheme of primitive recursion. The so f of zero is z. So z better be an element of B zero. And f of sac of n is a g of n of f of n. 
And what is G? G is something given a natural number, given uh, a B of N, it returns a B of suck of N, right? Uh, one, yeah, out. Uh, okay, and that's the scheme of, of elimination. Yeah. So this scheme uh, uh, defines, I mean, the, the scheme, the elimination scheme plus the constructors define, uh, it's one way to define the set of natural numbers. Yeah. By the way, if you look at the scheme, uh, it, it, we can, we can, we can identify U with prop. I mean, that's a bit cheating, but okay. Uh, so B could be a predicate, or prop is like a sub-universe, let's say. Uh, so B could be a predicate, and then the scheme I've written down is the scheme of induction. Yeah? So Z mm -hmm. is a proof of B of zero, and G is a proof if, N, if, if B of N holds, and B of suck of N holds, and the function says, B holds for all natural numbers. Yeah. So using mm -hmm. this, the proposition as types explanation, elimination implies induction. But it is more general because it gives us actually a function. So in particular, it already captures uh, the scheme of primitive recursion. Right? So okay, so this is this is one possible definition of the natural numbers. So now uh, the interesting thing is that I can never talk about the elements, yeah. So I cannot I cannot actually observe that I use the symbol zero or the symbol suck here, obviously, yeah. But here is another definition of the natural numbers. So another natural definition would be uh, I just use the same symbol. So zero is n, let's call it n, n bar. And then there is an operation uh, two times, uh, which, oh no, why, okay, a bit. Mm. Yeah, okay, uh, I have to use one here, okay, I'm a bit. But, uh, two times is a uh, operation from the natural numbers, natural numbers, and um, two times uh, plus one is also an operation, okay. So here's a little bit of a, of a mismatch. I am shifting. Uh, uh, I have to add zero extra, otherwise it doesn't work. But that's a detail. Uh, but anyway, so this definition of the natural numbers, uh, I mean, yeah, I could start with one as well. Let's start with one here just to be uh, compatible or whatever. Uh, so but this definition of the natural numbers is, is a binary, right? It's a binary representation of natural numbers. The first one was unary. But the interesting thing is that if I give you just the type, you cannot distinguish these two types. Because there's nothing you can say about the type which distinguishes these two representations. Now, okay, so just the type, with just the type, you can't do anything, but we could just have we could just say, okay, let's define uh, the ring or the semi-ring, like semi-ring or rig, rig, rig. Yeah, let's do natural numbers uh, with zero plus uh, what else? Uh, one times, right? Mm -hmm. It's called a semi-ring or a rig. So now I, I I can also define the rig of binary numbers, right? Is it clear what I mean? I mean, it's a, the structure, natural numbers mm -hmm. together with addition, uh, mm -hmm. multiplication, and all the laws uh, which you usually have. Yeah. Now, the point is, in type theory, I cannot distinguish these two rigs. Why? Because in the language of rigs, there is nothing you can write down which distinguishes binary from uh, unary numbers, right? Yeah, for example, for both of them, you have that x plus y times z equals x times y plus x times z. Yeah. There's nothing you can say here which distinguishes these two representations. And that's what I want. Because I want, I mean, I, I, I'm looking at my numbers. Uh, they are numbers. 
And I don't care how you represent numbers, whether you do them in unary or binary, they're numbers. If, if I'm interested in representations, then I'm talking about representations, not numbers, that's something else. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in, in type theory, um, you cannot distinguish these two. And that is something we only understood uh, after, uh, no, that's not true. Actually, we understood it a while ago, but we didn't really spell it out, I would say. Um, but, uh, so this is called um, the structural equivalence principle, or SEP, structural equivalence. By the way, not all rigs are the same. Yeah? There is a rig of, of booleans, right? Booleans uh, with, I don't know, false or uh, true or true and end. And that's different because you can distinguish it. Right? Um, you can write on expressions which distinguish the, the booleans from the natural numbers. Uh, they, they, are not, they are not equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. um, but these two are so so i won't i mean i do want to make differences but certain things i want to identify and this is related to this univalence uh, principle so yeah some people call it an axiom uh i don't like the word axiom because we don't use axiom okay that's the difference between okay you asked earlier whether it's an axiomatic theory and i would say no because we don't have any axioms Um, why? Because everything should be expressed in the structure of the language. There's no axiom. What do you mean by that? Well, yeah, I mean, for example, if I say, if I define the natural numbers, the natural numbers uh, come with this principle, this elimination principle, yeah, which is a way to define functions. There's no axiom. Yeah. So, so you get from it induction, which you may think is an axiom, but in type three, it's not an axiom. It's a consequence out of a mechanism to define functions. Yeah. So, okay, so this is, so univalence basically tells you, uh, okay, and here we come to equality. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I was a, little, a big fan of what they yeah. Um, because these two things are actually equal in the sense of, of type theory. Now, mm -hmm. uh, so what is equality? Um, so there's actually, I think uh, Leibniz, he, he, he described equality as uh, equality of indiscernibles indiscernible, so indistinguishable things should be equal. But this is a bit negative, yeah. Um, so I would say two things, two objects, which behave the same way, yeah, they should be equal, not positive. So these two objects here uh, behave the same way. I said I cannot, I cannot put a, 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 a hair between them in type theory. Yeah, because I cannot look at the representation. So hence, these two are, are equal in this sense. They're extensionally equal, yeah? If mm -hmm. I have two objects and I cannot distinguish them, they are really the same. I mean, this is a negative. They have all the same property, which is positive, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever I do with one, I can do with the other. Any observation with the one, I can do with the other. So what's the point of saying they are different in what way? I mean, if they're different, then there should be a way to, to see the difference. Right? So this is, uh, I mean, this is a uh, idea of extensionality and that's expressed in this univalence principle. It, it, it does say that uh, uh, two, uh, two types, I mean, uh, the technical details are maybe not uh, so important, 
But the Bailey says there are two types which are equivalent in the appropriate way are actually equal. And as a consequence, uh, I said it was a big other sudden. Okay. Uh, no, no, okay, okay. So as a consequence, uh, uh, structures, two structures like this are also equal. So what is actually, the structural equivalence principle is actually a consequence of univalence. So now, okay, equality. Uh, so what I was, uh, okay, a bit of a stupid thing. Uh, so what I was actually, um, yeah, what I wanted to say is, um, yeah, what is equality, right? So in, in type theory, for every type, you have an equality type. Yeah? So if, if A is a type, so let's say A is a new, mm -hmm. then you have, and you have two elements of A, then you can form a new type, A equals B. And the question is, what are the basic principles underlying this type? Now, how would you define, how would you describe equality abstractly, what's equality? Hmm. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean describe abstractly? Yeah, I mean, so if, I, if if you want me to describe abstractly what are the integers, I would say the integers are the same ring, right? Oh no, the natural numbers are same ring. The integer are actually a ring, right? Because you have subtraction, sorry, I was wrong. So can we capture the essence of equality by giving some laws? Right here, I, I write some down. Oh, it has to be an law. equivalence, obviously. Exactly, an equivalence, yeah. So A is equal to A, right? If A is equal to B, then B is equal to A, right? And if A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C, right? So these three equivalents. There's another principle I would say, if I have a function f from A to B, and A is equal to B, then F of A is equal to F of B, right? Yeah. So this is usually called a congruence. Yes. I mean, in this case, all functions should be the same. So that's a, a, a first approximation, and that's actually something we actually use. I mean, I used it actually a while ago. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we introduced the idea of a set to eat. A set to eat is a, is a, is a set with a relation on that, that, that tilde, yeah? and it has all these properties. Yeah. Actually, for one set, it has these properties, and then you have to say what is a function between set to eats. And the function between set to eats is a function between the carrier, which preserves the relation, which is a congruence. So that was mm -hmm. the idea. Now this is a uh, uh, okay as long as you think that your functions that you say that your equality is a proposition. So if you, if you, if you have that here, equality is a proposition, then that is completely fine. Right? But equality is not really a proposition. Um, why? Because if you think back on here, uh, or even identifying the, the, the numbers and the binary numbers. Um, so if you think about, uh, here we say two types are basically equal in a nutshell, if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements. Mm -hmm. So then, but how many ways are there? Okay, so if, if we have two, let's say we have a, a, a you know, we have a, a, a type a, which has the element 0, 1, uh, call it A, and the other element uh, type, which has the elements true and false, right, B. So these types are equal because they have, I mean, there's an one-to-one one -one correspondence uh, between the elements, right? But actually, not true. There is not one, there are two, right? Can also do this, right? So mm -hmm. two, so what I'm saying, if you think about equality of, 
of, of types or equality of structures, then there is usually one, there's more than one way that two things are equal. And that I wouldn't call a proposition, that's a type or a structure. Because it's not just a property, but I have to, you have to tell me which one, right? There is a difference in the choice. Mm -hmm. So hence, it's not a proposition, it's a type. And now things are getting a bit more difficult. Uh, because uh, here you have, okay, you have uh, uh, reflexivity, which I call it. Uh, you have an operation symmetry, which I call minus one. And okay, this is a bit the wrong way around. Uh, okay, let's just try it like this. And the composition operation. Yeah. Uh, so usually, okay, so usually composition is actually the other way around. And then it's written with a circle, okay? Mm -hmm. Transitivity with the arguments in a strange order. Okay, okay. but now uh, these elements, uh, they are actually uh, elements. They're not, uh, they, 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 I have, I can ask questions about them. And there are some very important, uh, it turns out when you start to work with, with this equality, there are some very important principles, yeah? So for example, uh, if you have F followed by reflexivity, transitivity of F and reflexivity is the same as F. And reflexivity, transitivity with F is also the same as F. And then you can, I think, the laws are like this, so. So I think you know the laws. They are, they are usually called the laws of a monoid, but that's not actually a monoid here. It's a category, okay, that's a category. But it's not just a category because there's some more because we have these inverses, the symmetry. And this shows that F composed with F of minus one is reflexivity and F of minus one composed with F is reflexivity. And then this is a group. It was like a group. I mean, if you look at the laws of a group, but uh, uh, it's not really a group because we have not, um, we don't have not one carrier, but we have a family of carriers, right? So that's a group root. And um, yeah, so equality, so the first approximation, and uh, first we say, okay, the first approximation was equality is an equivalence relation. But this was not good enough, okay? So now we say it's a group root. Oh, I should say something about the functions. So we need also the congruence law, yeah? So mm -hmm. so here, if f is a function, then let's call it, uh, so p is this, then I have an operation, let's call it a cong, okay, cong f p, which is f of p or, uh, yeah. Uh, and now there are some laws for cong, namely that cong of the identity of reflexivity, uh, uh, what is it, Kong of the, yeah, Kong of the identity function, no, is it right? Oh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, Kong, Kong of F applied to the reflexivity, so this is really the proof that F of A equals F of A is identity again, right? Uh, that, I mean, at least identity of A is in this identity of F of A. And the other law is that Kong of F of uh, P followed Q with transitivity is then the transitivity of the component. So it's like, and, and these things are called functors. So F is a functor. So that's a notion for category theory. Uh, so, okay. So group eat give you a, a, a better picture of what equality is, but it's not good enough. Yeah. Um, because the, the, the equality itself is a type, right? So here it's mm -hmm. a type, it has an equality. So you can talk about equality of equalities. Yeah. It gets a bit, uh, what is, 
difficult to build. Exotic, maybe. Uh, but actually, it plays a role uh, in, in, in mathematics. So you don't have a group of it, you have a two group of it. A two group of it is a group of it, wherever it's called home, every uh, equality is a group of it again. But that's also not enough, and you can see where we're going, right? So we get, we, we end up with something which is called an omega group root. And yeah, that's a bit of a interesting structure. It, it, it's certainly a bit more involved than equivalence relations. But it is possible to make it precise, you know. But maybe not today. Uh, 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 so I, I mean, I, I, I think I can explain what an omega group is. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a geometric idea actually, which is nice. So, uh, so yeah, I, I found it difficult uh, when we first encountered the need for omega group I thought uh, it's actually that should be more precise. It's a weak omega group root. So when we first encountered, this is actually essential, otherwise this whole thing doesn't work. Uh, uh, when we first encountered omega group we, uh, we were a bit scared and, and found a bit uh, complicated. But it turns out that um, algebraic topology, they already knew what, it, what an omega group is. Yeah. And, they, and, and, and they have got a very nice definition, uh, uh, which is uh, it's called a Khan complex. And it's not too hard to explain what it is. Um, so, yeah, Khan complex is a way to make precise what is what is equality, and and this is actually in how many iteration of equality you want to use, and how, how, which really corresponds how complicated your structures are. Now, you are right in most situations you don't really have to go very much behind equivalent relations or maybe group weights. Yeah. So it's, uh, um, but it's very strange to stop, you know. It's actually also very strange to write down the theory. Yeah. So if you want to have a uniform theory, the type theory is very, very simple, actually. The type theory for, for, for I mean, this is the semantics, but the type theory for omega group is, is, is extremely simple. Um, okay, I, I, I give you the definition in, in type theory, which, is, which I say is very easy. So, if, uh, I, I, okay, so we, so we, we, we say, for instance, well, equality has got a, something like a constructor. It's not really a constructor, but let's say. So reflexivity. Reflexivity, so if A is element of A, then reflexivity proves, I mean, this is what I call it before, now let's call it it again. Then it, of A proves that A is equal to A, okay? And now elimination. Elimination, okay, so, um, okay, let's go straight for the elimination. We could do recursion first, but we could do primitive recursion first um, as a warm up, um, but I don't know. Uh, that could be useful. Okay, so, okay, if, now the, the uh, even the recursion is actually dependent. So because yeah, equality is uh, dependent. Um, so if I say uh, uh, B is uh, a family from A to U, um, and and I have an element. Um, do you want to do it this way? No, I don't want to do it this way. Uh, let's say it's B is, 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 is something which looks like equality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and if I know, uh, no, okay, and I want to define a function f for any two elements. If they are equal, then I get an element of B, A, B. Here I need to be dependent because equality itself is already dependent. You see, for the natural numbers, the recursion wasn't dependent because the natural numbers themselves are not dependent. 
But equality, I mean, equality is a type of this form, right? It, it, it's a function gets two elements of A giving you an element of U. So when you define the elimination, you need something which looks the same. Like before, when we do the natural numbers, or was it? Uh, did we do it here? Oh no, it was somewhere else. Oh, it was here. Uh, yeah, here I had A, and A was a type, right? So mm -hmm. A looks like the natural numbers. But here, uh, for the for the for the equality, uh, I need something which looks like equality. And now, what do I say? To define such a function, it's actually enough to define it uh, uh, for reflexivity. So it's enough f of a of a, it of a, okay, uh, that's enough. I mean, to define, okay. And now I need a, a, a function, a g of a, and what is g of a? g uh, is a function from a in a to b a a. So again, so how can I define a function out of equality? That's always the question, yeah? So a function out of equality can be defined. It's enough to say what the function is doing for identity. Mm -hmm. And so this, this behavior on identity is given by this other function g. So given a function g like this, I can define a function f uh, uh, from uh, out of equality. So this scheme is actually already, already quite useful. For example, you can prove uh, symmetry, so symmetry is, is quite easy, right? So symmetry, so what do you want to prove? You want to prove uh, that for all A, B, and A, symmetry, or minus one, whatever, uh, if A is equal B, then B is equal A. Uh, but to define sim, using the scheme, it's enough to define sim for A, A, and it. And now I have to put something in here. And this something is then also of type as a type. Okay, what is B here? B is is actually this thing here, right? B of AB is B equals A, so that's the other way around, right? So B of AB is B equals A. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so all I have to plug, plug in here is it. So the function G of a is it of a yeah and that's the proof of reflexivity of symmetry and transitivity also works yeah so you can do lots of things with this already you can yeah you can actually anything any standard equation reasoning can be done with this recursion principle i tell you anyway i tell you the elimination principle okay it's not much more it's not very different it is um so if i have a b which gets two elements of A and the proof that they're equal, and then I give a return a type. Then, if I want to define a function f, which is a function, a dependent function out of equality. The, the, the pattern is the same. I define a function out of equality. Uh, it's enough to define it for for reflexivity. G of a, and what is g? Uh, g uh, is the function from a in a to b a a it of a. The bracket. Anyway, and this, by the way, this elimination scheme is called the J rule. And what can I do with it? Okay, I can do proof things about uh, equality in particular, for example, and uh, that was the ob observation of Martin Hoffman, that I can, or well, actually more, uh, uh, we can prove these laws. And actually we can prove all the laws of an infinity group. That, that came later, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so a very simple way to define an infinity group it is it's something which is like equality and type theory, which is a bit circular, yeah? I mean, obviously, uh, 
we want to have a, a um, let's say a more semantic uh, definition which doesn't already use uh, I mean use can use some type of theory but not not the whole thing so, so that um, yeah we want to give a semantics and then we need to make explicit what a weak omega group it is and it's a Khan complex actually we need uh, Khan vibrations uh, to model dependent types so this is actually a model of type theory uh, using Khan vibrations mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And yes, so this model of type theory, and I would need a little bit longer to explain it, is based on the idea of, of geometry in, in, in arbitrary dimensions. So you think of, <clears throat> you think of uh, geometric objects in any, in any dimension, yeah? like one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, four, five and so on, yeah. And now you can always uh, represent them made from simplices, yeah. So in two dimensions, simplices are just triangles. Just... One dimension, it, triangles. So, okay, so simplices, the zero dimensions are points, right? Mm -hmm. And one dimensions are lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. In two dimensions are triangles. In three dimensions are tetraeders. Okay, so and in four dimensions, naya. Yeah. Okay, let's let's not go there. Um, and uh, you can any geometric object can be always triangulated, right? And here, okay. By by the way, here I mean actually the, uh, the triangle is filled, right? And here, the inside of the tetraeder is, is actually filled, yeah, it's full of points, not just the outside, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah. It's a three-dimensional object. So it's not the surface, but it's, it's, it's everything which is inside. Um, now, any, as you say, I mean, any uh, two-dimensional object, you can always uh, triangulate, right? Uh, just made it up from triangles. Yeah. And so any three-dimensional object, you can make up from tetraeders and so on. So, so uh, it's implicit set is is a is a is a, is a structure uh, made up uh, out, only out of the simplices and they can be glued together in some ways. I mean, like, like for example, you can have two triangles sharing the side. Right? Um, uh, so any geometric object in any dimension can be described by just listing the simplices and then saying how they how they share sides okay there is also mm, something else there is a triangle every line is a triangle uh, which is basically it's a triangle there are two ways to turn a line into a triangle uh, you either you copy this point right this is like a trivial triangle or you 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 you'd copy this point So every, so, yeah, so the, the logic is this, every, okay, first of all, every triangle has three faces, right, which are the lines, and there are two ways to turn a, a, a line into a triangle, and that's similar here, every tetraeder has four triangles, right, four faces, and you have to calculate this, but there are actually three ways to turn a triangle into a tetraeder. In in a trivial way, yeah. So these are simplicial sets, and now the the Kahn property is, is something like this: if you have a triangle, not a triangle, one side is missing, huh? then it, it, it said is Kahn if you can fill it. If there's always a line here and 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 a filler. And geometrically, this always exists. This is quite a bit surprising, yeah? Because if you draw this, yeah, then you have a filler by just going along this line and then going along this line, right? Mm -hmm. And you can now, step by step, uh, stretching it a bit so that it looks like this, yeah? So these are, they are homotopically equivalent because all you do is, is I mean, you can also go the other way around. You can, you can move this, 
point uh, until it is somewhere here or something, you know? So in geometry, uh, every geometric uh, simplicial set is actually Khan. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, but this Khan property is exactly we need to describe Omega group reads because um, yeah, you have, uh, you, you have these composition, for example, you also get the symmetries, I mean, the inverses, and you get all these laws. So that's the interesting thing. If you just say you have a Kahn simplicial set, so, so what's the idea? Okay, hang on, what's the idea? The points, if you have a type A, so the points are the elements of elements of A, yeah? And, and the lines are actually the equalities, yeah? And then here, these are equalities of equalities, and these are equalities of equalities of equalities, and so on. And, and this sort of geometric picture exactly captures uh, this very apparently very abstract idea of of what is an infinity group. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a it's like a model in interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a model. So it was when uh, Vavotsky introduced uh, homotopy type theory with univariance principle. <clears throat> he was obviously concerned that he needed some semantics, otherwise it could be inconsistent or something. So he then, I mean, because he is a, he is a, that's exactly what he's doing, or was doing algebraic topology. So he said, okay, uh, uh, we use the, the Khan, uh, Khan vibrations, and we can model uh, homotopy type theory. And then he had to prove, actually. I mean, there are there is some effort involved because you have to prove that these Khan uh, structures, Khan vibrations, are closed under all operations of type theory, and in particular, they permit uh, univalence. They they you get the univalence principle justified in the semantics. And that's what he did. He, he never published it, but there is a paper which is based on uh, on, 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 his, on his work. Mm -hmm. um, there was a there was a, a problem, uh, or at least from my point of view, there is a bit of a shortcoming in uh, in uh, Uvotsky's construction. It used classical logic. Yeah. It used axiom of choice actually. Um, I mean, it's uh, very clever. I mean, he, 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 I mean, obviously, he was a very clever guy, so he was able to, to also prove this univalence principle, which was very important. But he used classical logic, and and this was actually not easy to uh, to get rid of. Um, and it's actually not completely uh, resolved. Um, uh, there isn't, I mean, the, what you have to do is, uh, and I, maybe that, if you remember from last time, that was what we, uh, what we talked about. So, so if you want to be uh, constructive, you have to add more information to your construction. So we need simplicial sets with some extra structure. Yeah. Uh, but in particular, the Khan filler, which is just, yeah, the problem is, in a way, that the Khan property in classical mathematics is just you say there exists, but you never you never make explicit what it is. Whereas in constructive, you have to say, oh, it's this, and that's how it behaves. Yeah. So that was the the, the problem or part of the problem, and um, the Thierry Cocon. Uh, he tried to solve this to give a, a notion of simplicial set, which also works constructively. And he discovered that there are some really fundamental problems with simplicial sets to make them constructive. Um, but in the end, he moved away from simplicial sets and he moved to cubical sets. And cubical sets are very similar to simplicial sets, right? So he just used squares and cubes. And so, 
And uh, so Thierry, uh, yes, he also added a condition, which is called uh, uniformity. And so he also did this Khan condition for cubicle sets, but uniformly. And this way, he then managed to uh, give a constructive uh, interpretation of the univalence uh, axiom. And the nice thing about this is, once you have a constructive interpretation, then you can also implement it. So that's the basis of, of cubicle actor or cubicle type theory. Right? I mean, there are a number of cubicle implementations now, but cubicle actor is a, is a system which uses exactly this idea. And so that's important because before, uh, when we didn't have this interpretation, then this univalence axiom is really a bit of a strange uh, object because you can, it's like an axiom really. You have it, but you can compute with it. And that's bad. If you want to run your, 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 your programs and then you have something where you say, oh, I don't know how to compute this. That, that means it's not really uh, computationally well behaved anymore. But uh, this is cubicle uh, interpretation. Uh, we were able, or actually, uh, uh, people in Gothenburg, uh, or in Gothenburg, I mean, people not including myself, were, were able uh, to uh, to implement uh, homotopy type theory in a way that it actually computes you know, as a program language. And that, that, that it was necessary this, this, to have this model to be able to compute you know, this universe. What do you mean by you say to compute with it? Okay, so univalence, okay, I haven't given, okay, I give a definition of univalence, so univalence. So univalence is a principle in type theory. It says the following, okay, okay, let me, let me start with something. Um, if you have two types, A and B, in U, mm -hmm. okay, then I can define the notion of equivalence of types. So that's basically their one-to-one. -one. It's slightly more complicated. There's a one-to-one -one relation. Uh, actually, one way, okay, here's a simple way to define uh, what's, an, what's an equivalence. Equivalence is a function from A to B, which has a left and a right inverse. So there's function G, uh, uh, or yeah, G, G, L, and G, R from B to A, such that if you G, L composed with F is the identity, and F composed with G, R is the identity, okay? So. You can go back and forth, but it's important to go back with two different functions. Mm -hmm. It's a bit tough. I'm, 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 yeah. You could think, why is G and G are not the same? Yeah. And the funny thing is, it doesn't work. So, yeah. And I'm not. I don't think I can explain this yet. No. But this is only one. This is called equivalence. Equivalence. And okay, there's there's there are other notion, other ways to define equivalence. Uh, but that's the, the shortest one. Yeah? It's not 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 necessarily the most intuitive one, uh, but it's the shortest one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now, okay, now we say now equivalence is is uh, is actually reflexive. So we can show if two types are equal, then uh, they are also equivalent. Okay. It's simple because we only have to show. So if you if you remember the principle. Uh, the elimination principle equality, or actually the recursion principle means we only have to show that A is equivalent to A. And that's easy, F, all the functions are identity. So so, so this function here, uh, I, okay, I call it, what do I call it? Equality to equivalent, uh, I call it H, okay. Uh, and now the, statement is that this function is an equivalent. So, okay. So, so this, okay, this now plays a function f, so it goes from here to here. And so we have two inverses, one left and one right inverse. 
that you've written. In particular, it says that A equal B is equivalent to A equivalent B. Which means, okay, equality of types is the same as equivalent. But mm -hmm. uh, if you add to this is univalence, you you will an axiom. But univalence, you could just add this as a principle to type theory. But then you may have a big proof. You may have like you define a big term of time natural number, right? And somewhere in this term you use U A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you say, which number is it? And the computer says, I don't know. Because there is this UA in the middle. I don't know how to compute this UA. You have like a program which you haven't finished. But as soon as you know how to compute this UA, then in principle, you can reduce this to a number, maybe two. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is why it's important to have uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good practice model, otherwise, you can't run it. Oh. There's, by the way, there is a funny, uh, not funny, I don't know, there is an example of a computation in homotopy theory uh, where we know that the answer is two. Um, and with univalence, you can run this program. And it should compute to two. But the problem is nobody has a computer which is big enough to run this. So, so it's believed that it should it should terminate this two, but our implementations in the moment are not able to reduce the term. Yeah. So, uh, even though we know it is two. <laughs> but okay, that's a bit of an esoteric uh, uh, computation. Sorry, a bit stepping back a bit of a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So, so when you say that type theory is a foundation for mathematics, right? Yeah. What exactly do you mean? Because like set theory is a foundation for mathematics, right? Yeah. Basically, the idea is that whatever you do in mathematics, you can translate into the language of set theory. And the translation kind of you get in the language of set theory is going to be something consistent. Mm -hmm. So lots of, so my, probably most mathematicians, logicians don't actually believe that that translation is meaningful in any way, that there is any, that for, for example, von Neumann ordinals capture natural numbers in any way. The idea is just to translate it into this, language of set theory and then to show that it's all consistent it doesn't lead to a contradiction so it's a foundation yes. in a epistemologic kind of sense we don't believe yeah, but look, hang people... on there's, there's a bit more there's a bit more okay um in a way a good foundation should reflect the way you do mathematics right it should be i mean it should be natural in a way yeah and now i claim that set theory doesn't fulfill this uh, requirement, right? Because, um, and that's quite funny, actually, there was a, a talk uh, by Kevin Buddard, uh, who's a mathematician, and he wanted, he got interested in type theory, and he wanted to, to formalize an argument uh, 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 by Grotendieck, yeah? And Grotendieck, at one point, um, says, uh, he, he, he uses this idea that equivalent things are equal. I mean, Grotendieck didn't know about univalence, right? He just, so, I mean, you have two structures which are equivalent, and at some point you replace one by the other. That yeah, should be quite natural. Because everything you do is structural, so it shouldn't be matter. Your choice of representation shouldn't matter, and Grotendieck just naturally did this. But it doesn't work in set theory because you cannot just, I mean, it's hard work to, to prove that actually in this instance, you can replace 
one with the other. You have to work, right? It's, it's, it's really, but mathematicians, they would just say, okay, we know it works. And we don't go away with these details. We know, yeah. But it's, it's false and it doesn't work in that same way. So you see, I mean, there is a, yeah, so I think, I mean, set theory is not a very natural way, not a natural foundation of mathematics. And this is a different point from the question of constructivity, which, which is a different topic, which I also think is important, but why is it important? Because I think by thinking constructively, you can make differences which matter and which are sort of put under the carpet if you don't. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but this is a different point. This is a good point. If you want to, that your mathematics uh, should allow abstractions to done easily, done easily, and 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 this is not the case in set theory because you cannot hide the implementation details. Now, I think lots of mathematicians have an intuition. Uh, that they can actually do this and how they can do this. And it usually works, but it's not reflected by set theory. It's something they know, which they often cannot make precise, but it, it's not, it doesn't correspond to set theory. I mean, this was Wawotsky's point about univalent mathematics is this idea that he wanted that what people are actually doing should be reflected in the foundation. Mm -hmm. No cheating. Yeah. And this is, I mean, this is particularly important if you want to formalize mathematics, because if you formalize, I mean, you want to formally on a computer, you want to check it, then it's a not, it's not okay uh, if there's something which doesn't, which you say the mathematician say, yeah, it's, uh, it's always okay, I know. Yeah, you really have to fill in the details. And there, you, there you're really lost if you try to do it with that theory. So there is a bit of overlap between this concern for foundations and the concern for being able to formalize it and verify it using computers. Yes, yeah, so um, I mean, uh, the point about, I mean, the foundations uh, is uh, to make uh, reasoning precise, right? I mean, you can always reason sort of intuitively and we meet and we argue and we say, okay, but this is obvious and, uh, uh, yeah. And, and then comes the point when we say, okay, let's write down the rules, okay? So we like set up, set the reason, write down the rules. Oh, here they are, the axioms, rules of predicate logic. You make everything precise, yeah. And um, and then it seems to be uh, that's the question of feasibility, right? Uh, we we know in principle we can and we can do these derivations in set theory, but we are not we are too lazy to do them. I mean, it's just too much work. We just know in principle. But now, when you have a computer, you can actually do it, right? It, it's not just in principle. It is. You can really do it, yeah, because the computer can can do all these stupid calculations, can check that everything is okay, can generate uh, the the boring proofs and so on. But in the end, you have something, uh, a derivation which exactly you can check. Right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, we would be it would be ridiculous if we do mathematics and have foundations and don't use computers, right? That would be. I mean, that would be very weird, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like you want to f fly to the moon, but don't use a computer, right? Uh, no, not a good idea, okay? Well, for classical mathematicians or for people who were trained in classical logic, uh, yeah. Gödel's results are pretty much 
a death of this program of trying to formalize everything and run everything? On no, the I mean, I don't think that's true at all, actually. I mean, um, Gödel just says that you never uh, can do everything, but why would you want to do everything? Right? You just want to do something. Right? It's, it's, and okay, Gödel, okay, and Gödel in particular uh, says there is no system where every proposition is either provable or the negation is provable, right? And that's a, a, a from a claim from a constructive point of view is a completely strange idea, right? <laughs> why? Um, well, because it's, why would you always prove p or not p? That's, that's uh, basically, I mean, that's a form of exclusion, right? Actually, funny thing is, constructively, uh, intuitionistic propositional logic is already incomplete. Yeah? You don't have to go all the way to arithmetic. Uh, in constructively, pro uh, propositional logic is already incomplete. Why? So the principle of excluded middle, p or not p, is not provable, nor is, is negation provable. So it's, I mean, okay, I'm saying a propositional logic with quantification over proposition, I mean, so second order proposition logic is incomplete already, which is not true for classical logic. For classical logic, it's, it's complete, you know, but not. So completeness is a, is a very weird idea. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't think that's a problem at all. I mean, uh, yeah, it means, okay, it means if you if you present a logical system, uh, you cannot prove the consistency of this logical system in itself. Yeah. Big surprise, who would have thought, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> only too nice, right? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Hilbert believed otherwise, right? Yeah, Hilbert, yeah, I don't know what he really believed, but yeah, he, he had this program uh, to reduce everything to finitary mathematics and something. I, I don't know whether he really believed this. Uh, that I think he, th I mean, no, I think what he was, he, I don't think he would have even thought that you can prove this consistency of the system itself in it. He just thought that is enough for all the mathematics you usually do, but not the consistency of mathematics. Now it turns out that the consistency of mathematics is something which is equivalent to, to some very low level theorems which Hilbert would have wanted to include, yeah. So the consistent, so, so it's actually, Gödel uh, shows that already when you do a primitive recursive arithmetic, you're already incomplete. So that's, uh, yeah, obviously that's a very, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very early point. But no, I don't think it, it matters at all for, for formalization. It's just a fact, right? It's, it's life, but it doesn't mean that you cannot formalize the mathematics. Yeah, okay, you cannot prove you, when you have a system like you, uh, a homotopy type theory. I cannot prove the consistency of homotopy type theory in homotopy type theory. That's true, but I don't think that's a problem. Right? It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, sorry to keep you. Uh, uh, no, 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 thank you for, for, for your time and effort. And I really appreciate it. Because sometimes it's difficult to get from, from texts the feeling of what it is all about, what, what are people trying to do. Um, yeah, well, I think I tried to say a bit too much in, in, in the time, and maybe I was a bit overwhelming, so I apologize for this. But, so, what's the word? Okay. Um, Tosin, can you recommend some something to read apart from uh, listening to you and apart from your short article about Martin Kaufman? Yes, um, I don't know. I mean, did I send you my lecture notes or? Uh, you did. Okay. On type theory and category theory, right? Two different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there may, I'm sure there are better things to read, but these are closest to my Good stuff. heart. <laughs> what? what? Uh, they are a good start, yeah? Uh, okay, the problem I have is that I never like things other people are doing, really. I mean, um, okay, that's not completely true. I, I did mention this article by 
bei Teleco Kong, right? Mm -mm. I don't, I don't yeah. remember. Okay. Uh, constructive interpretation of the univalence axiom. Uh, it's, you know, it's Kokong and some other people. Sorry, I, I should really be fair. And, uh, Kokong, Huber, uh, Mertberg, and Kuhn. No, Kuhn, Kuhn, Kokong, Huber, Mertberg. C C H M. Mm -hmm. I said you. Yeah. Uh, so that's a book. Of, uh, this is a, the article about uh, this cubical interpretation. Mm -hmm. But it's quite technical. So, so when is remember. your book coming out? Uh, when I finished it. So I mean, I can send you chapters uh, if you if you if you if you like to proofread it a bit. Uh, I, I would be very happy. But uh, okay. to commit. To. Please do. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, what? Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, you're, you're welcome. It's finished now. <laughs> well, you're, no, 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 it's, it's not finished, but I'm just, I'm just saying thank yeah. you. Yeah. You don't have to say thank you always at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time and effort. And, uh... Yes, um, yeah, well, that's certainly a, a good thing to read, but I think it's, I mean, okay, the other thing is the hot book, uh, I think, which I already mentioned as well, which is a little bit out of date now, but it contains quite a lot of very important ideas. Mm -hmm. But apart from reading things, um, why not do things, right? Um, so, so that, I personally, for me, that works much sometimes better. Yeah? Uh, and I don't know whether, I, I mean, what I would suggest is install the ACTA system on your computer and mm -hmm. then formalize some mathematics which you already understand, which you know, and try to translate it into, into ACTA. And that's quite fun. Actually, it's fun, I, I think, because you have to be very precise now. I mean, you, you did things on paper and now you have to be, uh, much more precise and it's quite interesting you sometimes realize that by being very precise changes a bit how you do things i mean it, it means maybe what you have done on paper needs a bit uh, of massaging to work well on a computer i i find it quite fascinating but yeah. so what what exactly is agda it's not a general purpose programming language right Oh yeah, it is a general purpose programming language, uh, but it's all, it's an implementation of, of type theory. Uh, and it also has an recently acquired this cubicle uh, mode basically, which makes it into an implementation of homotopy type theory. So, so there is a lot of cool things one can do. I mean, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a programming language, uh, it, but it can be used as a proof system and as a replacement for set theory. And it can be used to do any mathematics you want to do, apart from you have to do everything from scratch or not everything from scratch. There are some libraries, but uh, depending on what you want to do, you may have to, I mean, you cannot rely on anything being done, the whole un underbelly uh, not being done. And uh, there's also the issue of automatization. There is some automatization, but it's, it's so far it's, it's limited and uh, not as easy to use as one would like to be. Yeah. I mean, it can be quite fun. You can, when you, when you try to do a proof in ACTA, you can just say, you do it. And sometimes it, 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 it does it for you. Right? It, it, but it gives you a term. It gives you evidence. It's not just, there's a nice thing. I always think a, a prover who would just say yes or no is a bit, I'm not really, wouldn't trust it, but the prover who says yes because is much better because then you can check whether it's because it's actually right. What is the relationship between type theory and functional programming? I noticed yeah, that functional uh, programming people are interested in this stuff a lot. What is the connection? No, but also type theory, I mean, ACTA is basically a functional programming language. It's a very, okay, so 
if you, I mean, uh, so for example, Haskell is a functional programming language, and Akta is actually implemented in Haskell. Yeah? Uh, so what are the differences between Haskell and Akta? So Akta has dependent types, uh, and I think it has a much more sophisticated, more precise type system. And Akta cares about termination. It cares that your definitions are terminating, which is a, a, a important requirement for them being uh, mathematically sound. Right? I say it cares, but you can also say, I'm a doctor, shut up, you know. You may not see that this is terminating, but I do. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, you can just use it as a programming language. So, if you, yeah, it's, it's a programming language with a very explicit, it's a very, not explicit, but a very, very powerful type system. Yeah, I mean, try it out. And, I mean, I will, yeah. try it out. And... Yeah, I've never. Oh. Okay. If That's you, a lot to think about. Interesting, what I can also give you some. Ideas. Sorry? It's a lot of ideas, so I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you want to try out ACTA, I can give you some projects uh, to do. Right? Uh, there's actually something I wanted. Uh, to do, which uh, which is related. Oh, did we talk about the negative translation last time? I don't know. Which is related to the negative translation. But anyway, yeah. Negative translation of intuitionistic logic into the classical. Yeah, yeah. the double that. negative. Double negation translation. Yeah, yeah I wanted to prove uh, that, that it's complete for classical logic in an appropriate sense. Uh, in what sense? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, first of all, we can interpret um, classical logic as negative proposition, where a negative proposition is one for which uh, for net not 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 p implies p, right? Mm -hmm. And um, now, this is soundness, but completeness would mean. If, uh, if for all, if you, if you, for all negative propositions, you can prove something, uh, I mean, semantically, then it's true, let's say it's true, then you can also prove it. Now you cannot prove this, but you can prove uh, the not, not, uh, well, I think, okay, I haven't done this. So I can prove the following. If semantically a proposition is, is true negatively, I mean, negative proposition is true, assuming all the all the propositional variables are negative as well, then it cannot be that there's no derivation for it. Which classically means there is a derivation, okay. But constructively it mean it cannot be that there isn't one. Because you, you cannot get the Yeah? You mean a cl classic classically valid, right? So you take negative formula? Yeah. And it's classically yeah. valid. Yeah. No, no, I mean, negative formula, uh, for negative formulas, okay, you use the usual connections uh, for negative connection, connectives, including uh, false, no, yeah, false and true, but you, you use a different, you use a classical interpretation of or. So A or B means it cannot be that both are false. So that's the only mm -hmm. change. This is a negative translation. And then you should be able to prove that if uh, if, the, if the negative translation of a statement is valid, then it cannot be that there is no derivation. At least for proposition logic, classic logic, uh, not mm -hmm. predicate logic. I think you need some more, you need to think a bit more. Derivation in what, in which system? Oh yeah, uh, natural deduction, or oh, whatever you like. I mean, if you if you prefer, uh, you can Gensen uh, sequence calculus or whatever. I mean, but which rules? I prefer natural deduction. Or classical. A classical. I mean, yeah. 
Classical. Okay. Classical. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so when I do uh, classical logic, um, so I, I just add either excluded middle or uh, indirect proof as a rule, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you can prove, you can say to prove uh, uh, to prove A, it it's enough to prove uh, that not A implies false, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was something stronger. Ah, you can also say not A implies A, right? This is another form, it's equivalent. So to prove A, you can just assume not A. Right? And derive a contradiction, yeah. No, 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 it's even better. You want to prove A, and you think it would be good if I would say, if I would know uh, not A, right? It's equivalent, you can think about it. I mean, if I, if I not say anything wrong. So, okay, you, but because if you can derive, uh, if you can derive A from not A, you also can derive false, right? And from false, you can derive A, any, no A. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, you get, for anything you want to prove, you get its negation, you can just assume, right? That's classical logic. I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, so let's say again. So the rule is I want to prove A, yeah? Yeah. So now I, I prove that not A implies false. Yes. Okay. Uh, but instead of false, I can prove that not A implies A, right? Yes, yes. Because if not A implies A, you also have false. So you know that not A implies false, hence A. Yes. So what classical logic means, whenever you want to prove A, you can just assume not A. Yeah, but then you need to, but that's an assumption. You need to then prove that A with that assumption, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you prove A and you think, I would like to have an extra assumption. What about not A? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense because if you want to prove A, you believe that A is true. Therefore, you're making yeah. a rubbish assumption. It shouldn't help you. If does. the world works classically, yeah. it's a useless assumption because you're assuming false. No, it's useful because you need it in your proof, right? Yeah, but if you think about the truth, not about your derivations, right? Sure. No, but I'm thinking about my proof, right? Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, that's right. Yeah, you can always assume not that. Yeah. Because you don't believe it's true, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 Look, I've spoken to a few, few Russian intuitionistic logicians, and they believe that it's way, way too restrictive to not use classical logic in your meta reasoning. Yeah, they're wrong. The sign it's it's very it's very religious and very dangerous. No, no. No, that's not, I mean that's always strange. If you don't agree with the mainstream, you're religious, right? But maybe the mainstream is religious, right? No. Do you know Andrei Markov, Russian intuitionist? He's dead now, but like Markov, one of the in the fifties. Oh yeah, the Markov principle, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was famous for coming to first year exams uh, at university and failing students because they believed in complex numbers. <laughs> so he gave very bad name to this hardcore intuitionism. But Markov, uh, I mean, it's not, I mean, he, okay, Markov principle is already a principle which is intuitionistically not acceptable. Okay. That's, that's not good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I find that, um, especially as a computer scientist, I find it very, very natural to think constructively. I find it rather a bit weird, this whole classical stuff. But I mean, it's saying, I guess, uh, not restrictive. I don't know. So you, you don't think of type theory as a formal syntactic theory, right? You, you have some other ways. No, I mean, it is as well, right? I mean, type theory, obviously, especially if you use an implementation as a formal theory, right? 
So yeah, and we investigate this and, and prove things about it. But it is, uh, first of all, uh, an idea, right? Uh, an intuition. And, and then, I mean, that's how things work, right? I mean, that's to me. I mean, you first have an explanation idea and then you make it precise, but it, it's not, I mean, you don't find a proof system uh, in like going around and, oh, here's a proof system. I wonder how it behaves, you know? You, you make it, right? I mean, and, and why do you make it? Because it reflects some intuition. I mean, not some people seem to think. That, yeah, that's that's not how, how set theory works, right? Nobody no, has this no. intuition that everything is a set. Yeah, no, but the, actually, it is set theory was based on intu intu intuitive ideas. Cantor's idea of, of sets, right? And then Frege uh, tried to make it more precise. Um, and uh, okay, and then Russell found that there's a problem. And then Zamedo the, the and then Frankel, they fixed it. So it all it started with some ideas, which were then be made precise. That's obviously like how it works. This idea uh, that there is a proof system, I found it yesterday. I wonder what it's doing. Uh, come on, that's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, but these days, for example, again, set theory, right? Most people don't believe that set theory represents anything of substance. But then they shouldn't just, use it. Then they shouldn't use it, right? <laughs> well, it's just a way to establish that what you are doing that is off substance is not contradictory. It's purely a technical tool, right? People yeah, don't I, believe I, I in it a bit, in the way I'm you a believe more, in the It's a bit negative to say, oh, I only want what I'm doing is not false, right? This is uh, typically classical thinking, right? I want actually to be true and meaningful, right? so I'm a bit more positive. Okay. But anyway, let's maybe meet again. And yeah, it was good to chat to you as always. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be in touch. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Hi. Right. Thanks, Tost. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye.